Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Bible Study, The Triumph of the Lamb, a study in Revelation. Today in the Sunday class, we discuss the river of life from Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Let's listen in. Father, thank you for the book of Revelation and for the study we have done here. We pray, God, that you would bless this time together. Uh, that you would bless our study and that your will would be done among us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, because I'm just not ready to quit the book, we're going to start today in Genesis. Yeah, <laughs> 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 guys are laughing like I'm joking. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Genesis 2, 9 through 17, and 3, 1 through 7. And then we're going to read Revelation 22, 1 through 5. And what I want to do this morning is a comparison. We're at the very last part of the book. We should start at the very beginning part of the book to kind of try and tie this whole thing together. And that's, I think, really what's what's going on here in chapter 22. So if I could get someone, we'll, we'll just kind of compare similarities and differences here. If I could get someone to do Genesis 2, 9 through 17 for me, please. Thank you, Marjorie. And then 3, 1 through 7. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. And if someone could do Revelation 22, 1 through 5. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Okay, go for it, Marjorie. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Fishon. It winds, it winds through the entire island of entire land of Havila, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It runs along the east side of the Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you surely will die. All right. And chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Have you ever caught this before? Maybe you guys have all caught this before. I never have. What does it say God... What did God put in the garden for them? To get food. This is... You don't ever think it's trees. He put trees in the garden for them mm-hmm. to get food. But did you notice how he des- how the trees were described in chapter 2? 2 or 3? Uh, 2, in verse 9. Please them to the eye and good for food. Interesting. Because it's the same exact description of the other tree that they were not to eat from. Was pleasing. I've never made that, I've never seen that before. I'm sure there's an implication there. Well, yeah, there is an implication there because... What was God withholding from them by not giving them that tree? Wisdom. Or, no. Anything. No, I don't think he's withholding anything. He's just told not to touch it. Yeah, that's, their, that's just God's right? tree, and yeah. that nothing is withheld from them. Everything they need, that which is good and pleasing to the eye, and that which is necessary for food, it's all there. So they don't lack anything in the garden. Luth- I can't remember if this is Luther or someone else who says that the tree probably just looked like every other tree. 
Uh, there wasn't anything particular, like it wasn't in the middle of the garden with, you know, a big halo around it and angels <laughs> flying around it or anything. It was just like the other trees. It was good and pleasing to the eye and all of this, but they knew they weren't supposed to eat from it. Uh, but not by not eating from it, it wasn't as though they lacked any creaturely gift. Well, Everything like, was there for them, which is also, very, it's kind of curious, yeah. You know, it's also interesting is you actually put it there. Well, why not leave it out if it's going to... Well, you know, know it, it, you know, this is great. So Luther says this too, and I think this is actually very helpful, is that that was their church. That tree was their altar. Uh, not that they would offer up sacrifices there, but it was a reminder that whose place is this? It's God's. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this is kind of like, I mean, what I really, unfortunately, did not do a great job of, but tried to get it in the sermon today is the garden's not mine, it's God's, and he gave it to me. Our time is not ours, it's God who's given it to us so that we can go to church, and it's his time. It's not our time, it's his time. Um, I didn't say that in the sermon at all, I meant to. Um, but the point here is, you know, it's there to remind us of whose place this is. No, granted, God walked with them in the cool of the day and all of that stuff, uh, but this was a reminder that uh, we've given this one is God's, and we don't we don't deal with the things of God. We're still creatures in all of this, and so that's that's the point. It wasn't simply there to say, "Don't do it or else." Though I do think we can probably say, given the command, it was there as a test as well. Um, Will you remain faithful, or will you go for something else? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't get in there. Like when you tell a two-year-old, <laughs> "Don't touch it." These are the rules, and they're like, "Okay, is that line really solid." Yeah. How how I, far do we go? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. also interesting because it it's like one of the first and only commandments God gave them. Yeah, it was the yeah, yeah sort of the only well. Yes, yes, it's the first commandment given to Adam. Right. right. Don't eat from that. Yeah. Um, or a, or a rule or hey. Yeah. No. There were also be fruitful, multiply, fill the right. earth, uh, take and eat the whole garden. But those were sort of blessings. This is the one forbidden thing from them. You have everything you need. I've given you everything you need. I'm asking you not to touch. Right. This. And you're and I'm still God here. You're not. Kind of like child. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Well, I was just going to say, that's kind of like a, a boundary that gets set. But the other thing that I found interesting was that. Eve was the one who took it one step further and said, or you shouldn't even touch. And I don't know if it's too much of a stretch to say that I think that God would have allowed them to touch it if it had a flower to maybe even pick the flower and smell it. It's just eating of the fruit yeah. that was forbidden. Yeah. And it, so so they could enjoy it. They just couldn't eat the yeah, fruit. Yeah, that was the fruit. That's right. That's fair. I think that's the right thing. I mean, we can conjecture that a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, though it, the, the question is, if Eve says that, where did she get it from? Who was her preacher? Um, it was Adam because Adam was the one given the command so it's kind of interesting that so he didn't listen there's an addition given to the law in this sense here um, I have a question um, you said it was a tree like all the others and they didn't need it to survive right but it was different and Eve knew it was different it was different in that it was God's but it wasn't it was different in that she knew that it would give her wisdom hmm it or death. It was different in that it was God's. It wasn't different in that it was like a cherry tree and everything else is an apple tree. That's what I mean by that. Um, it was a tree like all the other trees. It wasn't. It wasn't. In appearance, it looked like all the other trees. Yeah, that's that's all I'm getting out. That I'm not. Yeah. It, of course, it's different because God set it apart. There's a holiness to it. It's His thing. That's true. But she knew it was. She knew it was different because God had told Adam it was different. She knew it was different because she could gain wisdom from it. Wisdom. Right? I don't know and where also, you're getting that. Hold on. Where do, you, where do you get that she's going to gain wisdom from it? Verse I think that's six, the devil who says and that. And also desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some and ate it. Right. Where she gets that, I think, from verse six. the devil. Well, but I doesn't it go back to verse 17 uh, in chapter two that says, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Yeah, I mean, for gaining wisdom in that way, but it's, it's good for doing something that they aren't supposed to do, for knowing... Not wisdom in a positive sense, but a wisdom that they are not supposed, supposed to, have. to have. We we talk this way too. I mean, this is the reading from Isaiah today. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Mm-hmm. My ways are not your ways. It's not it's not wisdom in the positive sense, like Proverbs kind of wisdom, but rather uh, a wisdom you are not to be accessing in the things of God. 
Um, and that was the problem, right, with eating from the tree, is that they decided to be like God. It's good for being like God. When it says that, when it says they're for gaining wisdom, it's gaining, I think we can imply this, it's good for gaining wisdom to make us like God. Because that's what they're doing. They're, they're trying to gain God-like status by eating the fruit. That's what the devil tempted them to do. Um, so that's so there is that aspect to it. You're, you're right, but it's not it's not as though she was trying to achieve something she needed. Yes, correct. She wasn't lacking in any sort of wisdom that was necessary. It was a forbidden wisdom. That's that's all I'm getting at there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Okay. Well, now we've read all that. <laughs> we've got kind of a good idea of what's going on. So, so what are we seeing here? Give me some of the landscape of the garden. Well, what's what's there? We've already discussed one thing. River. Four rivers. Rivers, trees. They had something we don't have. Yeah. Water. Water. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. This is. Gonna fill up a whole lake with this today. Um, Gold aromatic resin. Yeah. There's um, there's rivers that flow and it gives you know beauty and life and all of this kind of stuff. We see the gold there. I mean, this is all very interesting stuff. Uh, now let's go to Revelation uh, 22, 1 through five. And I want you to compare what you read in Genesis 1, or excuse me, Genesis 2 and 3, and what you read here in Revelation 22, 1 through 5. Uh, Carol, if you could do that for us. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, with fresh crop each month. The leaves were made... The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun. So the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever in it. Okay, so now, a couple. So, so what do we see similar here? Are there similarities and differences? There's rivers, right? Okay, so there's a river flowing through where? The city. The city. Now, there's a city, not a garden, right? Which is kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if we want to put too much into that. But there's a river flowing through it. And what does the river do in the Garden of Eden? It waters and trees. Yeah, it gives life, right? right? So this water is going to, in a sense, give life. What else do we see? The tree of life. Yeah. How many trees are mentioned here? Is it one or two? Two. two. I think it's two. Mine is, mine is very confusing in the language because it says on either side there is a, mm-hmm. the tree. Mine says on each side. So yeah, yeah, right. So each side there is the tree. Mm-hmm. How can you have the tree on both <laughs> sides? It's confusing to me. I, you I could, but maybe maybe the river maybe it's big enough that the river runs through runs through it. it the river, maybe that's what's going on. The river runs through yeah. it. That's like a that's like a movie, right? Uh, yes. I. I I was doing this last night, I didn't have a commentary, so I couldn't figure it out on my own because I'm not smart enough, but I, I think there's two trees on either side, you would read that way, but then when you have the singular, the tree, and I didn't have the Greek with me, so I, I don't know, well, let's just, let's just, pre- well, well, it's, well it's, kind of. But you could say an apple tree sits on either side of the river. It's yeah, but you would, but you, would you say, would you say, but you couldn't say the apple tree sits on either side of the river. Without referring to only one tree, because there's a it's a it's a the not an uh, yeah that was my confusion. Okay, oh regardless, uh, here's why I think it matters to some extent. If there's two trees there, how many trees were in the garden of significance in Genesis two? One. one. No. Two. 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 What were the two? Oh, that's right. The tree of life. Tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If we have two trees here, what are they? Just Both trees of life. Which means, what is not there, even the potential for sin, even the potential for death, that has been removed. It's gone. Uh, the temptation to do anything is, is out. And I mean, that's what we've been talking about for the last number of chapters, and this is just another illustration of that. But I do think it is significant if we have two trees of life now, it's just to say that the tree of death has been replaced by something. By the tree of life. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what comes from this trees? 
What were the trees in the garden good for? Eating. Eating, right? And what do we have in this tree? Fruit. Fruit, Fruit right? Mm-hmm. To eat. Eating and healing. And healing. Well, that's not the. Tr- it's not the fruit that heals, though. Leaves. It's the leaves. Right. Now, now if that's weird, I mean, unless you're making like an ointment or something like out of the the I don't know the sap or something. I don't know. Uh, where do we see leaves in Genesis two and three? Fig leaves. What's that? Fig leaves. Fig leaves. Fig leaves. And what are those used for? Covering, covering up shame, right? Uh, but, and that covering comes because of sin. sin. I'm trying to make this work in my head, but if, this, if the connection is there uh, between those leaves and these leaves, these leaves would, in a sense, be doing the opposite. They would be sort of restoring that which had been distorted. They'd be making, they'd be healing that which was broken for the healing of the nations. Whereas the last time we saw the leaves show up, uh, it was when division was taking place. Well, the woman you gave me told me to eat this. Well, the serpent you put here told me to do this. And there's division and leaves are covering the shame and the division. And that's all working together here. There's a unifying and a healing that's taking place because of the leaves. Uh, What that actually looks like, I mean, in concrete terms, I don't know if like they sat in a circle and sang kumbaya and passed the leaves around in a, in a happiness thing. I don't, you know, you know we're not smoking the leaves, Marjorie. I don't know what you just said, but we're not, that's not what we meant. Uh, it's not a Grateful Dead concert, Carol. Uh, this is... Uh, but the idea is somehow... Oh, goodness, peace leaves. Now I'm never going to get that out of my head. It's going to ruin this text for us of my life. What did you say? We are the Grateful Dead. We are the Grateful Dead. That's right. Yes, that's very good. It all comes together. So in heaven... And you know what? I mean, the chorus of the angels will probably be in... 48 minute guitar solo, so you're going to be just, I mean, just loving it. You never know. Uh, uh, so, but, but the idea here is that the leaves are there for healing. Um, and perhaps the, the implication that there's some sort of ointment or, or maybe shade uh, from, the, from the heat of sun, I don't know. But there would there be no need for shade here, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, but kind of interesting, I mean, the connection with the leaves there. Anything else that stands out that is significant to you? in the comparison of these two things? Well, it says, well, there will no longer be any curse, and, you know, as soon as they ate the leaves, they got thrown out of the garden. Everything is accursed, right? Yeah, that's right. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Uh, He's come to make the blessings flow as far as the curse is found. So the curse is being undone. You're right. Very good. Very good. Nothing else is accursed. And, And that goes to the Romans 8 connection there, which says... All of creation is groaning in anticipation for the resurrection of the sons of God, uh, or the revealing of the sons of God. Uh, th- this is the same idea here, that the creation is waiting to be restored and renewed to get the curse lifted from it. So no more thorns. Very good. Interesting, it talks about 12 months of fruit, or fruit every month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no... Now, why would, if you live... In an agrarian culture, why is that significant? How is that significant? There's no season. Yeah, Yeah, there's no want. There's no fear of, is it going to sprout this year? Are we going to get enough rain? You know, Uh, we were just talking about this with the Jews for Jesus guy. And he was saying in Israel, um, it's really that the climate there is almost the same as the climate is here. And that they have droughts there, as it turns out. And so there's a tremendous amount of faith and prayer for rain that things would be provided. There won't be a need for that prayer anymore because everything will be there all the time. Harvest season is every month. Yeah, that's right. And I think we can we can kind of talk about creation before the fall this way, you know. That when Adam and Eve would work, it wasn't toil, it was joy. There it is again. There's, I mean, Grant, I mean, this assumes that they were there for more than eight hours or something, but they wake up in the morning and look, there's fruit waiting for them. It's like a bed and breakfast every day. You know, there's waffles outside your door just <laughs> waiting to be eaten. I mean, it's just always there for you. And, and the connection continues to be made like when you think of the promised land, which is a preview of this. What does God tell, they, tell the people they will have to do uh, for food in the promised land? And this is too. Uh, this is stretching it too much, I think. But or not stretching it too much. But you, I'm not. It's not an immediate answer. God says to the people, "When you arrive in the promised land, you will eat food that you haven't planted. Uh, you will live in houses you haven't built. 
In other words, it's all going to be provided for you. And there's a, there's a, a shadowing of eternal life there for us mm-hmm. because everything is given. It's all gift, which is the way it was initially. Um, creation was gift. So uh, life as, the, as a person of God has always been by faith, trusting God to provide. Isn't the promised land also referred to as a land of milk and honey? Flowing with milk and honey. Which are also gifts, in a, in a sense. The sure. cow and produces the milk and the bees produce the honey. Right, and it's all, and all, um, and the key word there is the flowing, that it's not, it's just there in abundance, and there's not going to be any want, you know. I have another question. Yep. Do you think in this case that the 12 refers back to the um, 12 the way it has prior times in this book where it refers to the apostles and the um, tribes, or do you think it just clearly is just meaning the 12 months of the year? Question, what do you guys think? It's not the 12 months because they didn't have a calendar. Yeah, they had a calendar, a lunar calendar. The Jews. Uh, which makes 13 in a year. Yeah. All right. They have 13 in a year. Calendar didn't. They don't have a month cycle, really. Well, I mean, I'm not sure that's true of their entire festival. Well, this is what we learned again on Wednesday. Their entire festival year was based on a calendar, the way the moon worked. So they would say, like, so in the Old Testament, it would say things like, on the 10th day of the seventh month. Mm-hmm. So they have a calendar of some sort. Of some sort, but not our 12 month. Not a 12, I see what you're saying. No, not yes, a 12, not a 12, 12 month calendar, calendar is more of a... Um, Roman. I think he mentioned Roman. that. Too. Yeah, he did say something yeah. along those lines. Mm-hmm. When the Romans came in, they kind of... Mm-hmm. Julius Caesar and changed Right, well, I mean, the names of the months, you know, they're all Greek gods. Right. Or Caesars. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, so, or Roman gods or something like this. Uh, so, yeah, okay, very interesting. Well, so, then, if it's not the seasons and it's the people, what does that mean? What does this mean? Why would there be 12? Well, actually, kinds of fruit. Again, just the same way that um, before the temple was referred to, you know, described with the t- the twelve mm-hmm. um, gates and the doors, and mm-hmm. so the twelve fruits would be referring back to the um, disciples and also the twelve tribes of Israel. To what end? What? Why? To what, what? What's the reference it mean? To me, it would uh, again a further proof of everyone being able to partake of this food. Yes, that, that's where I think we want to go here, that this food, this meal is for all the people of God and that there will be no want for those it's who sufficient. are not the people of God. What's that? It's sufficient. Sufficient, yes, yeah, sufficient is the key word there. It's not a... I mean, what's one of the things that leads to wars, right? Um, famine. Famine. Mm-hmm. And people fighting for one thing over another. There's no need for that anymore. It's, it's all gone. All this is removed, and God is replacing it, restoring it, resurrecting is the right word. It's, it seems like they are getting food every all the time now. Yes. Mm-hmm. And just like when God gave them manna every day. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. There's a connection there, too. Like, who's providing this? It's God, right? So now it's much better. What's that? It's much better now. That's right, yeah. It's fruit. It's, it's, fruit, it's, not, the manna. it's not manna. It's not manna. Grumble about it. What does manna mean, Jeff? What this? What this? That's right. Very good. Yeah, we all learned that. Yeah, that's our Hebrew. Uh, what this? Um, Sounds like a two-year-old. That's right. What this? <laughs> so, okay, very good. Yeah, so there's some connections there. And, and what I want us to draw from this little exercise of making this comparison is that uh, the similarities and the differences between this and Genesis 2 are significant. The similarities imply that this is a new heavens and a new earth. It's not a bodiless existence, but it's creation the way it was supposed to be. However, it's better than that. Because there is no tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is no serpent slithering around to tempt away. If we've learned anything over the last 28 weeks, we've learned that that stuff is removed. It's just not there anymore. Uh, Those are the things that God has taken away so that there is nothing but life and abundance and joy. Uh, So you see there then this is uh, not merely a return to paradise, but something better than that. Does that make sense? 
Go ahead. It, it also says that they will reign forever and ever, whereas in Genesis 2, it said, for when you eat, you surely will die. So there, there's death, and here is eternal, eternal life. life. Right, very good, very good. Yes. Now let's go through, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 there is no more death. I mean, we talked about that last week. No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, any of that. Yeah, very good. Uh, let's work through some of these things here just biblically real briefly or not. Uh, the river and the city, there's a river that flows. And where does it flow from? From the throne of God. From the throne of God. In Genesis, where does the river flow from? Uh, from? Tree of life. It just kind of flows from the garden. I mean, it kind of makes it sound like the origin of the rivers is the garden, if I, if I read it correctly. Now, real briefly, where is the Garden of Eden now? Hey! I think they think part of it is underwater in the Persian Gulf. <laughs> Probably. I don't know. According to National Geographic, which is the end all be all. And they, th those who deny the reliability of Genesis and yet are still looking for the, the yes, Garden Mr. of Eden. Cameron. That's very good. What happened to the Garden of Eden? Why, does, why can't we find it anymore? Why don't we see it placed in the Middle East where angels are slaughtering people for trying to get in? They shut off the sprinklers. They shut off the sprinklers. I think it's the opposite, actually. It's the opposite. <laughs> flood washed it away. I think it's probably what's happened. Uh, if, if we do believe that the flood was worldwide, it's probably that it was just drowned out by the flood. Uh, and so there are no angels needed to guard things that are underneath the Persian Gulf now, or wherever it's been done away with. So, uh, Okay, very good. Okay, so, uh, but the river, and what do rivers do? They bring life. Uh, Psalm 1 is very useful in this. Blessed is the man who hears the word of God and keeps it. He is like one who, uh, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. And the leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers, and the wicked are not so. Uh, they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Uh, but you see that trees and uh, uh, vegetation that is next to a river, that stuff is strong, it is fruitful, it is good. So that's what rivers do, okay? Uh, in Ezekiel then, there's this fascinating passage where the, the temple, Ezekiel 47, it speaks of a temple where a river of water flows from the temple to bring life to everything it touches and it purifies. So as the, the, this, this uh, 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 clear water flows from the temple and it, and it rises, it floods everything and it wipes out the salt water. It gets into the oceans and gets rid of the salt water, which is a very interesting thing there. And it purifies and it brings life. And this is Ezekiel's symbolic picture of uh, what the presence of God will do on the last day, kind of what we see taking place here. Only the temple has been replaced in Revelation uh, by the throne. Because as we saw before, there is no need for a temple. Right? There's no need for the sacrifices anymore. Because God is the temple. He is present there with no need of a mask. Though, it still does say the Lamb is present, which means you only get in through faith in Christ. It's the sacrifice is the eternal sacrifice for us. Um, but there's no need for a temple and sacrifices to be offered up anymore. Christ just reigns. And the Father just reigns. Then you fast forward to John 4, where Jesus says he is the water of life. The water I give you, he says to the woman at the well, uh, if you drink it, uh, eternal life will spring up through you. And all of a sudden, the people of God start sounding like the temple because living water is flowing from them. Why? Because Christ dwells in their hearts, you see. And now we come here to this throne, and the water flows from there. And the whole idea then is that the source of life in eternity is God. And he's providing all that is necessary for life. Even in eternity, I think we can say this, we will not be self-sustaining. We will still be dependent upon God, only there faith will be sight and it will not be a fearful cry, but a joyful rejoicing in the things that God is doing for us. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, we depend on God now. We'll depend on God then. Now our dependence is out of faith. We don't always see him working. We don't always know what we're doing. Th he's doing then. It will be a dependence of sight where we watch the water flow from the throne, so to speak. That he will be the source of life, even as he is now. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Good. Uh, it flows from the throne. We, we just covered all of that. Uh, notice Jesus does say this too, uh, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Life comes from his word, from what he does. Life comes to us through water even now in baptism. And there's a connection there as well. Where baptism is both a death to the old sinful nature and a new life. So Colossians says, uh, in baptism in which you were crucified with Christ, but through which you were also raised to a new life. See, so uh, the water of baptism um, connects both to things like the flood, the, the wrath-filled flood, but also a life-giving water. Make sense? There's my son leading the way. All right. <laughs> Uh, tree of life in the center. Again, we have this tree. Uh, we talked about this in Genesis 2, 15 through 17. Now, I want you to notice this. I think this is fascinating. When we talk about the trees, the very first thing we always do is say what? You can't eat from the one. And that's what we tend to emphasize. We tend to emphasize the fact that they could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's where all of our focus is. But what is God's pride? What's the first thing God says to them about the trees in the garden? Does anyone remember this? Let me run back real quick. It's, so, it's not so much command as it is gift. This is what he says. You may surely eat of every tree in the garden. And whoever puts the verses in the text got it right for once. Stop right there. Everything is founded on the promise. You are able to not eat from that tree or you don't have to eat from that tree because you have all these other trees to eat from. Take and eat. The garden is yours. This is my garden given for you. Something like this, you see. And life was found in those trees, uh, in the fruit that they would eat from the tree. Um, so that uh, it's kind of a gift before anything else. We, so we start there with the promise. I don't think we ever focus on that verse at all. It's, it wasn't only until recently I heard some scholar, uh, some theologian, one of my favorite theologians kind of working through this, and he connects that to the Lord's Supper. And I've never even stopped to meditate on that section of the text. We always run, I always anyways run straight to the don't eat from anything, you know. But everything starts with the promise. It always starts with the gift with God. Um, so you have that there. Now we have another tree that shows up in the New Testament, which is the cross. And it's very curious that the cross is referred to as a tree. And if you come back Wednesday, I'll, I'll probably have more information on this for you because uh, I didn't do a whole lot of research on it. But if you have Jehovah's Witness friends, they'll tell you Jesus didn't die on a cross. He died on a tree. Therefore, if you have a cross, you're a pagan. So good for you. Um, but it's clearly a cross that he dies on. So why refer to it as a tree? That's a curious question. Um, it's made of wood. It's because it's made of wood. I think that's probably the basic answer, right? It's it's not made out of, you know, I don't know, styrofoam uh, or steel. Yeah, it's a, it's a cross made of wood from a tree. But it, it's interesting that it's called a tree, and I wonder, maybe this is going too far, but if there's not a connection here that if death came through that first tree, this tree that Jesus dies on uh, is the same kind of thing, like it brings human death on that cross. Um, and then from that cross comes the fruit of life. And you go to the sacrament. You take and you eat, you take and you drink from the fruit of uh, the body and blood of Jesus, which hung on the tree. It's also, kind of, kind of also interesting. Also kind of symbolizing him conquering it. Yeah, conquering, but see, I'm not sure I want to go there. I, I, I want to say first, before we get to the conquering of it, because I think we want to wait for Easter morning for that. I, I, I want to start here and say not so much conquering, but dying under the punishment that was deserved by those who ate it. Right. So the curses are placed on him. The curse of the tree is placed on Christ. Maybe that's the connection that Peter's going to draw in 1 Peter when he says he dies on the tree. Um, the curse of eating from that tree now falls on Christ. He's the cursed one. And then, yes, ultimately in his death defeats that. Uh, and so God gives him the name above every name. But before that... It's the suffering. And he stands in our place. And he, yes, exactly right. He's the one dying where we should where we have died or should have died or something like this. Yeah. Man very created good. the problem, but he's gonna stand for us in the punishment. Yes, correct. 
Right, and so the curse from the tree is placed on his back, something like that. So maybe it's more than just the connection that crosses were made from tree wood, and there's there's a theological implication there. But that's a, at that point you're, is a little bit of conjecture, and I would be curious to see if Carol's point there is if in the first century, if crosses weren't just also referred to as trees from time to time, and if that wasn't just like common word for it. Yeah, yeah. So kind of interesting. But notice this then: if we do make this connection between the trees and the cross, it is curious that it's. Uh, from the, that tree came death, and now from the tree of the cross comes life. So just as God said, here's my garden, take and eat. Now he says, this is my body, take and eat. This is my blood, take and drink, shed for you. Um, and this meal then sustains our faith. Sustains us in our faith. They may have originally used trees before. Actually yeah. Constructing a cross. Very well could have. Though I do know for certain these were not just trees lined up along the road because they were outside the city along the way into the city to remind people that if you're coming in here to cause trouble we'll put you on that you know right. um, I'm just saying early on yeah I mean you're probably right that's probably how they did it yeah yeah pick the nearest tree nail to it that's how you start a plague do you know that you just put dead people's you know the criminals bodies outside uh, the city as a warning and let the mice live in them for a while, and then those come back in the city, and that's how you get the bubonic play. All right. Uh, if you want any more information like that, come back Wednesday. All right. Uh, and now we have the leaves that bring healing. They don't cover shame. They restore that which is broken. So uh, kind of interesting stuff there. And I wonder, too, when they put the leaves on, it was to cover their shame, and it created a distance between them that wasn't there before. Um... There was no shame or fear before the fall. And after the fall, there was now something that came between them where they were ashamed of themselves, and so they covered themselves up. Um, if the leaves are healing, that shame has been removed. Something like that. Okay, uh, so far so good? Okay, kind of interesting stuff anyways. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Nothing accursed is there. We, we've kind of talked about that. The throne represents God's presence. We've seen the throne throughout the book. Who sits on the throne? The Father. Yes, that's right. And the Lamb is there uh, with Him. It's the, the throne of the Father and of the Lamb. Uh, so God sits on it. And His servants will worship Him because this is actually the ultimate goal, is the eternal doxology, uh, where we give praise to God. Or are in the presence of him and draw forth praise from uh, him, so to speak. Uh, face to face, not even Moses had this kind of access, you know. Moses could see what of God? What's that? His back. His backside. His rear end. <laughs> you want to do the Hebrew there. Um, and no, not anymore. Now we see him face to face in all his glory. Name, and and this, is, this is helpful for us. I mean, it's interesting because you can say, well, like the apostles, they saw Jesus face to face. They saw God face to face in human flesh, and that, that is true. Uh, but even John will say something like, we, no one's ever seen God except for him who came from God, speaking of Jesus. Um, and we have seen him in the flesh or something like this. Uh, but you and I haven't. Unless you were a little eye in the 60s or at a Grateful Dead concert, maybe you've seen it, I don't know. Uh, it all comes back to that here today. Uh, but, but typically, we don't see him um, apart from his word or in the sacrament or something like this. So he's hidden from us. And so here, uh, the hiddenness is gone because nothing separates us anymore. Uh, name on the foreheads, we belong to him. We're his people. Uh, that is a common theme throughout. No more darkness. What does that mean? Does that mean there won't be nighttime or naps or anything like that in heaven? <laughs> if there's no naps, that means there will be no cats, and that does sound somewhat heavenly. <gasps> hey, guys, everybody settle down. Everyone settle down. Just remember, cats are worthless. All right? Oh, no, just kidding. My, my kids, we play this game, Would You Rather? And the kids say, Would you rather be a dog or a cat? And we love dogs, but everyone's answer was a cat. Because you sit around all day and you sleep, and if someone makes you angry, you scratch them. And it's just perfect. I mean, you have staff. 
Right. You have staff? Dogs have owners, cats have staff. That's good. That's right. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure there will be cats, cats. lions, and lambs laying down together. And, and cats, cats have dogs personal dogs assistants. Yeah. What did you say? <laughs> said cats have personal assistants. Yeah. That's correct. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, very good. Personal personal assistant. Assistant. So, you know, <laughs> but do what you will with cats. Um, <laughs> but, well, but they take care of birds. Yes. Yeah, if you leave that in the so wild. Uh, <laughs> birds get in the house, you know what they do? Go to the other room and sleep. Uh, <laughs> but so there'll be no more night. Uh, there'll be no need for, because God will be there. And it's a different existence. I mean, it's not when I'm, I kind of, you know, I'm sarcastic here. There'll be no more naps, but it will be an entirely different existence. Like work won't be toilsome. We need eight hours of sleep right now because our days are hard, especially if you have three kids running around. Um, you know, it's exhausting, and so you need your body needs rest. There won't be toil, there won't be burden, so there won't be need for that. Uh, existence will be a sort of Sabbath rest. It, it's a rest from work. This is, I mean, we can almost look at eternal life as um, uh, the seventh day, resting with God. An eternal seventh day. Yeah, an eternal seventh day. Though, we don't want to say this, that there will be nothing to do. You see the difference there? There will be no more burden. But there will, it's not as if there will be a lack of something to do. It sounds like there will be reigning to do. There will be ruling to do. But what does that look like? It's a very different thing. Go ahead, Marjorie. I was just going to say that the way that I was reading it, um, they will not need the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And I was thinking about the fact that you put somebody in a situation where they never have sunlight, and it's amazing what happens to them. And so man does have kind of a need for the sun, not just to be able to get work done, but the the vitamins, the, the yeah, energy, right, right, yes, all yeah. of that. And God's going to give all of that. Yeah, to very us. good. That's a great point. Yeah, that's very good. If I were not lazy, I'd give you the gold star. But the, the <laughs> point there is that you have uh, again the source of everything. The source of life is God. So the water flows from the throne. He gives the trees of life. He's the one who gives life out. He's the sustainer of it. You don't need the sun to do it because God is there doing it himself. Uh, there's no means necessary anymore. So even though it's in the eternal rest, like you said, on, on Wednesday, the Jews for Jesus Christ said, it's not like sitting plopped on your couch watching TV. You have to do work as a rest. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's stuff to be done. I mean, we'll walk around and grab a fruit and talk and eat and sing and, mm -hmm. and laugh and dance. I mean, there's going to be stuff to do, and it may be... I mean, again, this is a little bit of conjecture here, but it may be that it functions like some sort of society after all the water is running through a city. Um, but that it's it's perfected, and so that it's not burdensome. People are there to be loved. Uh, things are there to be done and served, all to the glory of God, something like that. But again, and we talked about this before, it is different because it's not as if your relationships will be like they were once here. Uh, there's not going to be procreation, for example. So there will be no more need for marriage. So what does that, what does that look like in eternal life? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's very different. Um, yeah. That's my question. Um, just put it on my mind. Okay. I don't know. Uh, then let's finish up with this. Uh, and they will reign forever and ever. Now, I thought Jesus was reigning. What does this mean? Because who's the they? It's not the Trinity. It's the people. It's people of God. So what does that what does that mean? That this is eternity. That that will will never die again. Yeah, but what does reigning mean? Well, that alludes back to what you were saying about that we would have jobs to do or things, tasks that we would be doing. Yeah, I think that's kind of where this goes. Is remember, what is the chief part of God's creation? Who's the king of the jungle in, in the Old Testament? Yeah. It's not the lion, it's man. Humanity is to run the show. They're to tend to the creation and care for it. It's not the cat in your house that runs the show. Remember that, cat people. You're in charge. You tell yourself that every morning. Thank you. Uh, but it's, it's, it's humanity that's to rule over creation, and so this is just the point that we're being restored to what we're supposed to do. Um, we will reign, you might say this way, beneath the feet of Christ and alongside of him. 
Um, Christ is both our Lord and our brother and has returned humanity to its rightful spot in creation through the resurrection. So to reign doesn't mean to take God's place as ruler, but it does mean to reign with Christ over creation as we were initially created to do. And so I think that's probably what's being implied there in the new heavens and the new earth. Like Adam and Eve were created to tend to the garden and rule over it and subdue it. That's kind of what we'll be doing there. Um, does that make sense? Sort of? Good. All right, guys. We have one section left. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moorpark, California. We hope this has helped you grow in your Christian faith and study of the Bible. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.